Oh, hey, you. Welcome back to Troubled. Long time no talk. If this is your first time with us, Troubled is a independent podcast by survivors of institutional child abuse for survivors and the general public. Our mission, as always, is to expose and abolish the troubling teen industry. And in the words of our Lord and Savior, Immortal Technique, speaking is hard when you've got strings attached, so I'm gonna do it for you, because I ain't got none of that. We have no sponsors, no paywalls, no ads, and our biggest flex is the programs that we focus on exposing, like to listen to us on site, and then two of them have closed. Yeah, we're looking at you, Circle of Hope. The owners are facing over a hundred felonies this summer. And Lakeside Academy in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where they brutally murdered Cornelius Fredericks on camera for throwing a sandwich. Lakeside has now been leveled and will be a golf course. Speaking of Cornelius, this past weekend was the two-year memorial for his restraint-based murder. And unfortunately, it did take this long for advocates to privately fund and install a tombstone because a foster child can get murdered on camera and become national news in Michigan, but we're just going to leave them in unmarked graves. So she never takes the credit and she doesn't want it, but shout out to Candace, everyone who knows Candace, who's been working so hard on getting that headstone installed for Cornelius. Please go give her a virtual or real life hug because this took a lot of work and we really value and honor her commitment. If you would like to send in a clip to the podcast for our Justice for Cornelius two-year memorial episode, please just send it in via the voice message button on the Anchor app or email me, Miranda, at talktrouble.org. Since this episode is intended as like an 18-year look back on my 18th birthday when I was finally a legal person and allowed to walk away from the behavior modification camp in the Catskills that abused me and my friends and where I watched a child die, it's super relevant that obviously we started off, for me, focused on that Justice for Cornelius element, asking you all to join us on social media to continue to call the local prosecutor. The three charges that you helped us get in Kalamazoo for this situation have all been dropped, have been sent to probation. They promised us that those charges were just the beginning. That clearly was not true. I don't believe they had any intention of furthering that prosecution. But since coming out in the NBC article about how we utilize TikTok to further the justice for Cornelius cause and get this accomplished, remember Bain owned China Data, which owns TikTok at the time, and all that magical U.S. trading jazz happened. We all got permanently shaded. And unfortunately, the public interest, that virality and pressure has completely dropped off. And that is all that works with small town America. They chose to overwrite the day I was born, my birthday, with the day they murdered this child, which as someone who watched a 16-year-old boy die in my program during a meal, I just, I'm making everything about me. Look at Miranda making everything about her. Hopefully that narcissistic tendency, if you will, is contagious and all of the rest of you will make justice for Cornelius about you as well. Whether you recognize yourself in corn, whether you recognize another child that you went through the program in corn, or whether you're a parent and you recognize him as our child. Remember that when taxpayers fund foster care children going into residential programs, and when those tax dollars fund the abuse of these children, and in this case, the murder of these children, we are all complicit and culpable. So if you're like me and don't appreciate being used to systemically target and dismantle the families in your community, reminder, 53% of black families will be investigated and infiltrated by CPS. Cornelius was not sent into foster care because he was not loved or because he had some sort of behavioral issue that was so severe that he needed to be institutionalized. He and his siblings were sent into the foster care system because their mother died and their father was incarcerated. So whether children enter this system already traumatized like the Fredericks or not, they certainly come out that way. 
these are systemically racist and classist attacks on our community. And if you're new here, please check out our episode with Aaron McGinnis of Children's Rights so that you can hear it from somebody who understands the system and understands the data and not this little asshole just talking to her computer for no fucking reason. So reminder that we do have interviews with multiple staff from Lakeside on this issue and the attorney Q&A video. We have the screen record of that Zoom from July 2020 on our YouTube. And if you know anything, if you were a student or staff or someone affiliated with Lakeside or her new corn at Wolverine and you want to talk or you want to get involved in activism, please reach out to us. And I'll see you on all social medias under hashtag justice for Cornelius. So moving on, obviously there is a trigger warning and content warning on everything we do as a podcast or as a nonprofit or just me in general. Anything I say, whether we're in person at Six Flags, in the pews of the church, or on social media, just brand that trigger warning right across my forehead. That being said, for survivors, especially those from my own alma mater, the family, the Family Foundation School, FFS, Allenwood Academy, all the same place, uh, just different rebrandings to avoid everybody knowing how abusive they are. Common feedback is that listening to testimonials about your own program is potentially the most triggering. So in that vein, I don't think we'll be traveling back in time too much today. If you're interested in how FFS structured, we have about nine survivors from the family that are on the podcast over the course of the three seasons, and there's at least 17 episodes focused on FFS because I'm not obsessed or anything. What I'd like to focus on today is what I've processed from the last 18 years, although most of it has been processed within the last couple and while I don't currently have access to mental health support, which is something that is a systemic and chronic issue in our community, I wanted to take this time to go over what I did learn when I did have access. The trauma therapist that I had access to last in Texas was absolutely excellent, and there's a few post-its of gold nuggets that I continue to utilize in my day-to-day -day life, and I just wanted to share some of those with you. And then at some point, probably at the end of this blunt, we're going to get into the teary-eyed what Miranda realized by walking in circles in the garage next to the basement boiler room that I rent now. Because I guess you guys are the only ones who can believe how long it takes to make sense of something. To start off, though, let's just clarify the difference between PTSD and CPTSD. So PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, and CPTSD is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Y'all know I don't think the DSM is worth the rust-stained nickel that I just fermented inside my asshole for the last 18 years. And since CPTSD is still not really acknowledged, a lot of you may continue to get diagnosed with PTSD. The issue with this is the treatments for PTSD and CPTSD are not at all the same. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is something that you get from one singular event or up to maybe three events. If you're in a horrific car accident, that gives you PTSD. If you're in a war event, that gives you PTSD. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder is from long-term exposure to stressors that you cannot escape creating a chronic long-term cycle of functioning and oscillating through your different fight-or-flight responses. So this is something like being in a domestically violent relationship or growing up as a child in an abusive household or being put in a residential program. For me, as someone who has been in way too many car accidents totals, like we're talking, I had a bus and a truck total me out in my Prius within a year. So while I haven't been diagnosed as PTSD because of car accidents, I'm just going to diagnose myself here. I definitely have PTSD with the car. With that car PTSD, I dig that it is completely unrealistic that I am going to have a bus T-bone me every time I go through an intersection. I still genuinely feel the metal on metal push through my vehicle. Um, it's really not fun. But I know it's not happening and I'm like, oh my God, Miranda, stop. I drive all the time and the ratio of how often I get totaled out versus how many times I get in the vehicle, it does not support my concern that it's going to happen, quote unquote, all the time. 
Whereas with my CPTSD being about relational jazz, attachment jazz, people being intrinsically and fundamentally dangerous, oof, I do have, I do have all the proof and evidence for that. And the red flags that I get from people related to that, more often than not, my intuition's correct. More often than not, if I get a red flag from certain recognizable behaviors like love bombing or flattery or something like that, at the end of the day, a year later, 18 months later, it did manifest that way. That person wasn't being genuine with me. They were exploiting me. They were attempting to manipulate my perception of the situation and them. And more specifically regarding my institutionalization and therefore chronic distrust of the system, it didn't stop at the troubled teen industry for me. I have personally had CPS weaponized against me by people who pretended to be my friends, thus incorporating the system being weaponized against me by a peer-on-peer attack therapy. (laughs) So while when I'm driving down the road on a sunny day, magically imagining a truck T-boning through my reality, it's a totally realistic approach for me to be like, Miranda, that's the past. That's not happening now. That's not going to happen right now. Chill the fuck out. It is not realistic. And I found that it is self-gaslighting for me to try to minimize my intuition and my feedback that I'm getting from individuals in my real life. But yet that's what I do. I see red flags. I witness people exhibiting certain behaviors and interacting with others or myself in a specific way. And then I minimize and gaslight my interpretation of the experience based on oh, well, that's happened to you so much that that's what you see now. Instead of recognizing, well, honey, we've been through this for like 20 years. Maybe we're an expert here. And then back to the treatment element, the way that you would treat someone with PTSD like my dad, who is a 17-year-old Marine in Vietnam, is not at all the way that you would treat therapeutically, not just like, you know, treat them, but therapeutically treat me, who has CPTSD from being a 17-year-old who also watched a peer die, but in a behavior modification cult run by pedophiles that I was detained in against my will, that I did not consent to. He is a 17-year-old consented to this experience. I didn't. That's just like, (laughs) I'm sorry, that was just like me being like... (laughs) And a lot of the therapies for him are geared towards reminding him that even in a flashback, that this is the past, that none of this is happening anymore, that this is all stored inside you. And we might both be toy soldiers, and maybe we were, if you trace the roots, created by the same psychopath. We are not the same model. Our dads who served in the military were designed for the infantry. We're fucking psyops, you guys. We're coyental pro. Their mission ended decades ago, and ours never will. And so while the priority is to recenter them in linear time and remind people with PTSD that the moment they are existing in and that is haunting them is in the past and will never happen again, everything that happened to us is really still happening. The threat that we could be institutionalized against our will is a real threat. I have personally seen it happen to far too many survivors over the last year alone. The potential that someone you think is your friend could be your enemy and could be deliberately weaponized against you is a very real threat. People have proven to us time and time again that this is part of the duality of humanity. So this leads us to the first helpful tactic that I really found in therapy, and I want to share that with you and let me know if it works for you. I'd love, I'd love the feedback. Firstly, though, I want to validate that getting into therapy after quote-unquote therapy was used on you in behavior modification, it wasn't therapy at all. It's complete and absolute torture. But I mean, if you do look into the history, you see that a lot of therapies that governments and the medical community thought were excellent are just complete and utter torture, like electroshock therapy and lobotomizing and just the whole diagnosis of hysteria. 
So to further drop that in an echo chamber, I personally did not seek therapy until my program, The Family School, wound up on the cover of the New York Times. That first article entitled, It's Like Who's Next? An Alarming Death Rate at a Troubled Teen Boarding School in New York was an incredible trigger for me. If you've noticed, I have not allowed media to quote me except for one of the NBC articles with Tyler Kincaid because he's amazing. That is a personal boundary that I've decided to change, and I will link the Daily Mail article in the show notes below that talks about Agape and Circle of Hope, but also mentions the podcast and the family school and us. Speaking of, if you're a survivor of the family school, staff, a parent, yada yada, and you do want to participate in an upcoming article specifically about FFS, please let us know and we'll connect you with that journalist. But at the time that that original New York Times article was coming out, I wasn't, quote unquote, out of the closet, if you will, with my advocacy. Fuck, I wasn't even out of the closet with myself. And so while I communicated with the journalist, I did not participate in that article publicly. But I did send him three pages worth of my opinions of the article when it came out. Um, if anybody ever wants to see that rant, let me know. I had a serious issue with a random editorial line that he decided to come up with suggesting that we had to come to terms with the more likely fact that the reason our peers were dying was because of the exact reasons they were sent to the program in the first place, e.g. like a drug addiction or being depressed as a teenager. And then a few months ago with a New York Times follow-up article because the Child Victims Act with Liz and Liz and everyone else was out of court, they made a comment about meaningless punishments like carrying buckets of rocks up a hill. So needless to say, I have a lot of criticism about the lack of trauma-informed journalism in this area. Forcing children to carry buckets of rocks up and down a hill for 12 hours a day is not a meaningless punishment. And just because someone in the New York Times says I need to come to terms with the quote unquote fact that the reason my friends are fucking dying is because they had depression issues as teenagers. Can we talk about that? Like they had depression issues as teenagers because they were being abused at home. And then those people sent them to pedophiles who abused them further. But I digress. Didn't we say we were going to get to something my therapist taught me? All right. All right. Let's do this. Also, just a little disclaimer. I am in absolutely no position to recommend or endorse any specific modality of mental health therapy. So a couple of these tactics, because my therapist was a CBT, DBT therapist, are within usually dialectical behavior therapy. There is a ton of criticism for using DBT on people who are survivors of either a narcissistic relationship or a high control group. I personally find this criticism to be incredibly valid as the core foundation of dialectical behavior therapy is to utilize opposites, opposite thoughts and opposite like reactions and actions. And the reason this can be an issue is because a lot of these high control groups or these narcissistic abusers will utilize this same kind of idea. Not that they're using DBT per se, but there's a lot of using opposite repetitive behaviors. So like as an example, when I was at the family school considered to be a chronically defiant contrarian, I was put on a sanction called yes, thank you. What this essentially meant was that every response that I had had to be, yes, thank you. So I'm neurodivergent and I love to clarify things. Clarifying isn't allowed. <laughs> if you've personally met a DBT therapist and they forced you into some sort of perpetual affirmation like a yes, thank you, I'm pretty confident you should report that to your state board. And uh, I was on yes, thank you for pretty much the entirety of my stay at the family school because I did not comply. But per the whole 18-year review, I do default use yes thank you in my real life when agreeing with someone I don't agree with to move the conversation forward. It has become my default passive-aggressive defiant response, if you will. Example, Miranda Everything you said seems fine. It's just your tone that's the problem. Cue to Miranda. Yes, thank you. 
So I just wanted to put that out there because it's very possible that somebody listening to this has had DBT utilized on them in this way and are part of the community that criticize this as something to be used with people who have complex post-traumatic stress from a high control group situation. And like I'd mentioned, whereas with PTSD, you can focus on this specific event and heal the responses to that specific event. With complex PTSD, we have to get to the root of the feeling or the thought. And in the year leading up to me getting into EMDR, to isolate that moment that we would start with in EMDR, that event that we would replay, I had to actually make a list. And all we ADHDs are either like, yes, I love lists, or, oh, fuck, another post-it list I'm going to keep in my mind and forget everything else I had to do for the next week. So in therapy, a big issue I was having at the time was my interpersonal relationships with other advocates and activists in the anti-trouble teen industry space. And there were so many situations that at a certain point, I actually printed a chat group log of my interactions over the course of a year with a lot of these individuals and actually like went through it with my poor therapist. And if she ever listens, I'm so sorry and thank you. But I had tried to resolve the lack of communication or the miscommunication with these activists for over a year, and it had gotten to the point where I was completely gaslighting myself. I guess the easiest way to put it was that I'd gotten to this place where I decided that I just didn't belong anywhere and that I couldn't get along with people. I've talked about this a lot where I was like, is it something on my forehead? Like, how am I attracting this experience over and over again, especially with my interactions with other females? And that could be a whole nother podcast in and of itself. You know, how women have been conditioned in this patriarchal hierarchy to not be supportive of each other, but rather to tear each other down for safety within this construct. And I don't have a social psychology degree <laughs> yet, so that's really not my realm. But as it stands with the troubled teen industry, you can all remember these higher shirts in your program, the anchors in our program. Those are the students who've worked the program enough to hold the other kids accountable. And that's very much what I felt I was experiencing in the community. And it felt like I had this big scarlet letter on my forehead of like, hey guys, like I'm the unanimously voted black sheep scapegoat for survivor land, so come fuck with me. And we all know that within attack therapy, the way that you bond with other people is to team up on and attack others. I guess it makes us feel safer if we are one of the many fingers pointing at somebody else. But firstly, we are not in the program anymore, and our anti-program movement should not be functioning as such. And secondly, and this isn't meant as shade at all for the millions of people that can't relate to this experience, but when I got sent into the program, I was already 17. I was already very much who I was, and I was the kid who grew up reading books about young girls like myself who were thrown into institutions, into asylums, assaulted in every possible way. And usually at the end, they either disassociated, I never promised you a rose garden, or they get lobotomized, will there ever be a morning, the Francis Farmer story, or they die, the virgin suicides. And so maybe I blamed myself for manifesting this experience because those were the only characters in literature that I felt I could really relate to. And as a young writer, I put myself in that book. I'd read all the Orwell and Dostoevsky and all that shit in middle school, right? And remember, I grew up in cults my whole life. So Catholicism, altar serving, CCD teaching, Catholic all-girl high school level, hello. And for the many of you in the 90s who grew up in Amway, I went to all the seminars, T. Yeager, youth camp, leadership camp, all that shit. And during my whole childhood, I was really opposed to these things. That's why I was in Amnesty International and Justice and Peace and all of these extracurricular service-focused activities where I was, in my mind, fighting an oppressive system. So when I was transported into the fiction books that I read as a teenager, I took that as an opportunity to prove to the universe who I was and 
I had absolutely no intention of calling out other children or calling them up to the table or participating in their shunning or their abuse. And again, I know a lot of you didn't have that experience. And again, this is no shade on you. You were children in a behavior modification camp. And no matter what you did to survive, good for you. It doesn't excuse the harm that any of us caused. But you were children being tortured in a social psychology experiment that was deemed a human rights violation after less than a week when used on adult volunteers at Stanford University. The Stanford Prison Experiment, by the way, if somehow y'all aren't all Zimbardo heads already. And if you are, heads up, uh, one of his students, Scott Plaus, who's a professor at Wesleyan, does a intro to social psychology course for free on Coursera. And if anyone's like, she said we were going to talk about this therapy technique twice and we haven't gotten there, this bitch cannot stop ranting. You're right, and I shouldn't do this ever again when I'm having my coffee. I, I'm sorry. But back to it, that feeling, that feeling of being rejected, of being an imposter, of having witness syndrome in my environment. So here we have this fundamental wound or trauma, if you will. It's this belief that I am unwanted at every table that I sit down at. So in reviewing whether I really was an imposter in the survivor community, I had to trace this feeling back. So maybe you feel the same. Maybe it's your work culture, your friend group, your family, but it feels like every time you sit down at a table, someone's like, can she just get the fuck up and go? Who invited her? And so I sat with this thought that I'm invading, that I am unwanted and unwelcome and uncomfortable. I recognized where I felt it physically in my body and I tried to trace it back. So, okay, I feel it today from the community, but where did I feel it before? And as I traced it back, I realized that I'd had the same feeling of rejection from community, from a circle, from a group throughout my entire fucking life. There's a lot of things that I thought I got from the family school that were instead just cemented and reaffirmed and duly confirmed in an echo chamber within the family school. And then there are things like responding with yes, thank you as my only pre-approved way to be passive aggressively defiant vocally and not speaking to people while I'm using the toilet and bathroom stall. Also, something that's definitely from the family school is the moment my alarm goes off, my feet are on the floor and I stand up. That's a longer story. It's because majority, maybe 75% or more of the time, when I become conscious in my body, I believe I'm in the bunk in that trailer. And, and it's a majority of my life it's been like that. That's why we're having this 18-year look back. This last week has been really amazing. I've been waking up and, you know, not bleeding out my asshole for the first couple hours of the day and, you know, fun stuff like that. And I was like, what has fundamentally changed? And really what it's been is I've had multiple days in a row where I woke up and did not think I was back at the family. So I wasn't waking up in that absolute traumatized fear. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I don't know how many others this affects. I am like a feral traumatized animal in the morning. If you see me before like my two or three hours chain smoking in my car drinking coffee, I'm just, you know, silent wailing and crying and snotting out my nose. It's like a really gross thing. But whether you learned that you were unlovable or unworthy or not that funny from your parents or the program you were in, it's really important to trace it all the way back. Because the reason you might think, oh my gosh, I have always been rejected or I am, I've always been unworthy, no one's ever loved me. I mean, I know the program told you that because they told me that too. But what if it's always been that way for you? So maybe you're not paranoid and maybe you're not just hard on yourself, but maybe that's the evidence that you've been given consistently throughout your entire life. Because to be honest, I really do believe that the main target demographic for these programs, especially when we were in them, but still today, are the kids like us who are fight the power, fight the system, will fuck you up. It's the neurodivergent kids, it's the queer kids, the musical kids, the artists, it, it, it's always been us. 
That's the whole point of behavior modification and assimilating these personality types and these behaviors because we're the only ones who from birth have really been focused on deconstructing and dismantling these oppressive systems. Really think about it. A lot of us were the kid who told on their parents to their other parents or told on family members to family members for inappropriate behavior. I know this because a lot of you got sent to the program when you told on your abuser to another family member. And some of these situations are really extreme. This isn't, oh, I tattled that they spanked me with a belt instead of a wooden spoon and belts are harder to break on my ass. It's not that. Although, fuck your parents because that's fucked up anyways. Same Z's me too. But like Liz Ionelli as an example, she is a very regular situation where a child was sexually abused by a family member and upon telling their family that this happened, they were sent away to be institutionalized until they turned 18. If you saw the dateline that was focused on Circle of Hope, you see that one of the claimants there, her mother who was in that dateline, admits that she sent her daughter through their church because her daughter was sexually assaulted and she was trying to find her a Christian therapeutic environment to positively cope and get the therapies she needed after that sexual assault. When we're doing the trace back jazz or EMDR, anything where you're going back into your childhood, especially pre-program, this is where we get into a very sticky area of forgiving our parents. The whole parent shit is one of the most triggering things that I personally stumble across in the community. I don't know about y'all, but when they have that whole like parents breaking code silence group like a year or so ago, I was like, oh no. And while parents have contacted us and contact us actually pretty regularly, um, that's like not my sphere. I tend to forward that to somebody else who's less of an asshole for parents. The only parents that I personally deal with through the nonprofit and through the podcast are parents whose children were taken away and sent into the program through family court and against their will. This is far more regular than people are aware. Uh, at least I wasn't aware. I guess I just assume that if I don't know something, nobody else knows it. Do I assume I know everything? I don't. You guys don't feed into that. That's the program being like, Miranda's a narcissist. But in case you didn't know, a lot of these programs actually go to family court and testify against the parents. And per our last episode in the vein of supporting advocates who are focusing on their specific expertise, please, please hop on the socials and support all of these survivors that are going after family court for their element and their involvement in this parental alienation and also institutionalization of these children. You would not believe how often we get parents contacting us because they were in a domestically violent situation that was verified in the courts, and then their abuser was able to get their child removed from them because of the DV? This is totally insane. But I've personally reviewed court documents where TTI programs that y'all all know, like big ones, big ones, went to family court and said so-and-so parent is unfit and so their child has to stay at our behavior modification facility. And to be super clear, if that happens in at least all the cases where I've spoken with the parents, those parents now being non-custodial are not legally even allowed to have contact with their children until they age out. I see this tactic specifically focused at domestic violence survivors and then also when it comes to like which target of children are involved in this, it's usually, for again, for the limited cases I've seen, it's neurodivergent children and especially children with autism or children with mental health issues like bipolar or being diagnosed with BPD, which you all know, in my opinion, if you're diagnosing a 16-year-old fucking child with BPD, you should lose your license. Far too many survivors in our community have been diagnosed with BPD. I myself at 16 have possible borderline personality disorder on my diagnosis. The doctor that gave me that was found guilty of overdiagnosing these kinds of things so that he could get this, refer them into institutionalized residential long-term care of which he was getting kickbacks. <laughs> of course, of course that of course that was my doctor, right? 
But my main concern, and I think this is the main critique that you see out there of hyperdiagnosing BPD, especially over misdiagnosing it in women with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, by the way, is that if you Google it or if you even go see a real therapist, the diagnosis, the prognosis for BPD is really, really not good. Most of my friends that are diagnosed with BPD and are survivors were straight up flat out told by therapists that they would probably kill themselves. I'm really not sure how that's ethical in the first place. I guess it's falling under the conversation of like being transparent that unfortunately a majority of people who are diagnosed with BPD do not survive. So then insert Miranda's question of whether perhaps the reason that so many people who are diagnosed with BPD are not surviving is because their therapists are telling them that they will most likely kill themselves at the end of the day anyways, and then they're dropping out of therapy. Or maybe they're just like, why wait? Because that's a very real conversation that I had with a survivor I know where they're like, well, if I'm going to kill myself at the end of the day, why not just get it over with now? So yeah, stop diagnosing teenagers with things like BPD, which you really can't diagnose that in a teenager. Come on, you guys. Like, I don't have a degree, but if I understand that, so should you. And to all the parents that keep hitting us up on social media being like, oh, I saw what you said about this facility, but like my kid really needs residential. Which facility do you recommend? Oh, I just need a copy paste. We don't. We don't recommend any facility. Number one, most of what y'all are sending your kids off to residential for is completely fucking bogus. Y'all need to stop abdicating parental responsibility when your kids become teenagers. Babies become teenagers. Being a teenager is incredibly hard. It is an incredibly hard time to be a human. You are discovering who you are separate from your family, your friend group, and your community by testing boundaries and trying new things. And you're dealing with this while also having this crazy hormonal like fucking drug trip. So can you guys be nicer to teenagers? They're awesome. They're awesome humans. And a majority, as we know, of kids that are sent into residential treatment therapy, especially the ones who are left there to age out, are adopted children. And so, Becky, I'm talking to you, all you waspy, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, white savior complex missionary motherfuckers going around collecting kids that are not yours from communities that need our support instead of being deliberately and directly dismantled and targeted by these racist and classic fucking policies while you parade around on your fucking YouTube vlog being like, oh my God, so we adopted this autistic, traumatized, special needs child from the Philippines. Aren't we heroes? So no, Becky, you're not a fucking hero. And you're especially not a hero eight years later where you're publicly trading that child on a Facebook group because you can't deal with autism or you can't deal with his special needs. All of those factors that you voluntarily signed up for with full knowledge and consent upon adopting them, which is not the same thing when you biologically have a child. And oh, surprise, we didn't know we were dealing with X, Y. You signed up for that. You signed up for that for social media clout, you fucking psycho. But outside of you all need to just stop outsourcing parenting to pedophiles, there's this other angle. There's this thing called science. And per science, we've already determined that boarding school is potentially traumatic. And I just want to be super clear. Boarding school, like choke. Again, not residential treatment therapy, but just a fancy schmancy $200,000 a year boarding school is potentially traumatic. It isn't intrinsically traumatic like conversion therapy. I mean, like, good luck finding me someone who got out of conversion therapy and isn't traumatized. If you're that person, again, please email me. I desperately want to talk to you. But just the very act of removing a child from their peer group and their support system and, you know, just their familiar environment and sending them into a situation where technically they're isolated from everything and everyone that they already know, that's potentially traumatic. So when you already have a child who is traumatized or neurodiverse or who has special needs of some kind, it's absolutely imperative that they remain within their support system and with full unfettered access to that. 
So for the parents who are like, well, what should I do then? Here's the answer. If your child is in a serious mental health crisis or in the throes of addiction, it's absolutely important to recognize that whatever symptoms you're seeing are just that. They're symptoms. In order to effectively deal with a child with trauma, the entire family must be integrated into that treatment model. So the child needs a trauma-informed therapist who uses real peer-reviewed scientifically supportive techniques. And this should include family therapy. Repeat, you need to go to therapy too. In the event that a short-term inpatient stay is needed, it should again be short-term, local, and in that location and during that time, they should again have access to their support system. So that means they should have the ability without approval or supervision to get on a phone and talk with their friend or their aunt or you. I personally define short term as max 30 days. I do not see the purpose in staying in a residential facility for over 30 days unless we're talking adult recovery jazz or adult spiritual jazz and and we're not. We're never talking about that. After this short inpatient stay, the child should have local wraparound services for as long as needed and with access to as many modalities as they want to try. There isn't necessarily a treatment that's more effective for everyone. Treatments aren't generalized like that. But voluntary treatment where the person in treatment is enthusiastic about that treatment model, that's the best way. So example, uh, especially with adopted children who are often misdiagnosed with RAD, another thing like BPD that I don't have the qualifications to get into, but let's say we're dealing with something like that. Equestrian therapy is excellent. That is a really excellent way to deal with someone who has issues with attachment, issues being physically touched, issues emotionally bonding. It is a lot easier to learn to get intimately close and engage with an animal over a human being, especially if as a child has been taught and it's been proved to you that human beings are dangerous. However, to double down, if that child is afraid of horses and you push that child too far too fast, this will just reaffirm this fear and it won't just affect horses, it will just affect trust in general. But most of us didn't get equestrian therapy. I love horses. I would have loved equestrian therapy, but I never would have liked it at Circle of Hope, which was a horse ranch that was a therapeutic Christian boarding school because, again, Boyd Householder was a predator. Loving animals meant that I personally avoided the golden retriever at the family school because the relationship that was being offered to children with this dog as a therapy was an abusive relationship. It was also very abusive with the piglets at the family school. My peers were forced to raise them as infants, and then they would break their legs and toss them into a back of the truck, take them to slaughter, bring them back. You would be forced to eat the pig you'd raised, and then forced to feed that pig that you'd just raised to the new piglets that you were raising. And so, no, Miranda wasn't like, oh my god, let me raise pigs, that'll be therapeutic. And if your parents put you in that kind of an experience, I can see why you get super triggered to see parents in general involved in the movement or to have people be like, you need to forgive your parents and move on. It's for you. Um, I think it's for them, actually. I think there's a lot of people who would feel a lot more comfortable if we would just shut the fuck up and move on. And I don't know about you, but I feel like we've given them enough of our silence. So I'm kind of done with that. And if there's a better word for what I'm about to describe, please let me know because I would like a better word for discussing forgiveness. I feel like forgiveness is a really loaded concept, especially for those of us who had been consistently and historically invalidated and were never allowed to have any source of autonomy or to stand up for ourselves. Those of you psychonauts out there know exactly what I'm talking about, but I'm not really sure how to convey it outside of psilocybin and DMT. <laughs> Let me just break my own HIPAA and we'll use my EMDR exercise as an example. So for six months, my EMDR sessions literally once a week was a three to four second memory from when I was about like nine years old. It was the moments between when my mother pulled my head back from the metal cart that she just smashed it into and when the car horn went off in our driveway. 
it was my play day and I had to go and pretend that I'd, I don't know, run into a door, that nothing had happened and just cover up for the situation. I was concussed, vomited all over myself at the event, so they took me back to this kid's house early where he attempted to rape me. But none of that context was in my EMDR sessions for six months. It was strictly these moments. And long before I ever got to me in that moment, I focused a lot of my energy on the look on my mother's face of sheer terror and feeling sorry for her, which I know sounds crazy, but just I was conditioned with narcissistic abuse by victim narcissist personalities to take responsibility when I pissed a parent off and they hurt me. This was something that was duly confirmed at the family school. And I didn't realize that I was still doing it, that I was putting someone else's victimhood or trauma or something else above my own until I'd spent six months in this moment with a therapist. I've been conditioned to take responsibility for the way that others treat me and the way that they react to my existence in general my whole life. And then by the time I was 17 and I was sent into behavior modification, my entire reality duly confirmed this. And on the outside, sure, I rejected and I was like, fuck you guys, you don't fucking know me, you're wrong, you're blah. But I'm here to tell you 18 years later that I was wrong about how much I took home from that party. Months before I ever sympathized with the little girl that I was in that EMDR moment, which reminder, an hour a week for six months, I was focused more on deconstructing the intergenerational trauma in my family line and why my mother was doing the best she could with what she had inherited. Her grandfather was put in the wheel in Sicily as an infant because he was illegitimate. And for the next 18 years, he was physically, emotionally, mentally, verbally, and sexually assaulted. So when he turned 18, chose a name, and came to America, he brought all that trauma with him. Thus, his son, my grandfather, first-generation Sicilian-American, was an alcoholic with a gambling addiction who was physically, verbally, mentally, and emotionally abusive to my beloved grandmother, my mother, and my aunts, and all their foster kids. He'd grown up in the backwoods of Virginia. His dad was a coal miner who died of the black lung, and they were just trying to fit in with white privilege and white supremacy and be part of the American culture because, for the record, that's not who Sicilians were at that time. I mean, I've said it before, but it was actually in the family school. It was the first time that I was called the N-word by an Italian. My mother was six the first time she was called that by an Italian. For the record, in case you've never seen me, I have the M150 mutation, so I'm a redhead with freckles and blue eyes, which, if you understand genetics, is not just because I'm Irish. My first-generation Sicilian-American grandmother was also a redhead with blue eyes. Their daughter, my aunt, disowned me when I was 11 years old. She was the closest person and the safest relationship in my life up until that time, but our family was so toxic, and she was the black sheep scapegoat in the generation before me that she had to make that decision. It was an incredibly traumatic decision. And I can understand where these people were coming from to make these decisions in passing down intergenerational trauma that they hadn't healed for themselves. But it took a really long time, as in I'm in that right now, where I'm just finally giving myself permission and the space to get fucking pissed for it. Because in my weird fucking purist mind, I'm not allowed to hold them responsible for the way that intergenerational trauma played out in our family. But I'm also super pissed that they didn't love me enough to fucking do anything about it. And they want to run around being like, oh, we love you so much, Miranda, but fuck, look what you did to me. And I'm not telling you what to do. But for me, I really had to get to a place where I could really deconstruct and lay out all of this intergenerational trauma, it was really important to me to understand where it came from so that I could separate what I was holding on to that was mine from what I inherited unwillingly and without my consent. While this was super important for me, and it still is, it is in no way an excuse for the consequences of these behaviors or for the behaviors themselves. 
As a parent, I've made a lot of mistakes, especially because I'm poor and I'm a single mom and I have trauma that I didn't even start dealing with until a couple years ago. But this fucked up family heirloom of hating yourself and not being worth anything and fundamentally needing to change who you are to be allowed to sit at the communal table is not something that I taught my daughter. She can barely tolerate the sound of me breathing because she's a teenager and that's totally fine. But she's a neurodiverse queer kid that can come home and be like, shave my head and dye it purple right now because I want to, and I will. She has a parent that literally thinks the sun shines out her ass, and I'm sure that that'll have some negative fucking consequences. But <laughs> when she decided to get into graphic art, I invested in that future. I got her a professional tablet. I got her into courses to do all that jazz. When she came out to me, I told her that I don't think heterosexual is a normal thing to be, that I think everybody is a little fluid if they're honest with themselves or they're not afraid. And I'm sorry if that offends anyone, but that's how I feel. One of the things that annoys my daughter most about me is that she has a lot of adopted friends whose parents are typical of what the program is. And like one of her friends hasn't been at school in three weeks. And I think it's probable she got sent away. And so I panic and I try to be like, how can we save your friend? Let's find a way. And she's like, can you just stop? And again, she grew up poor. She had to change schools a lot. Her mom's a wreck. And so that sucks for her. <laughs> I'm sorry. But the thing I did accomplish here was focusing on the specific things that still traumatize me as an adult and making sure that we didn't reenact that this time in this generation. So as an example, fat shaming is incredibly common in our family. Sicilian women are gorgeously curvy. And since we've been in America, that has been an issue. Like there have been genuine eating disorders in every generation since we've been here, which is only a couple generations. I'm third, so eh. But my daughter's growing up in a different world where when my mother fat shames her, she rejects it, she stands up for herself, and then she calls a family meeting with myself and my sister to discuss how this needs to be addressed around the family table because we cannot have fat shaming as an additional intergenerational trauma given to the next generation. And I can't tell you how healing it is for my inner child where I'm seeing this mirror of this teenager who's very much like I was when all of this happened to me being able to stand up and stand her ground. I'm not saying everyone should go out and collect some children. I'm just saying children are an epic mirror. And even though my teenager like doesn't want to be in the same room as me ever, I'm pretty confident like teenage me and teenager would have totally been friends. And so since I'm operating from this perspective of trying to avoid getting cut off by my kid, I definitely recognize that that is a realistic and valid response to the abuse we've all been through. In fact, from what I've learned about our trauma, I'm not sure that you can heal the relationship if that's your intention while maintaining that relationship while you heal. People and parents are just too damn defensive. They have a really hard time acknowledging what they put you through without turning it into a complete self-defense. I wasn't able to get through a family holiday for years without them bringing up the family school until I moved across the country, literally. I had to separate myself from my family unit and the environment that I'd grown up in or spent most of my life in, in order to really get to the work of healing myself. You do not need to be accessible to anyone if what you're doing is trying to save your own life. And once you're at a point where you feel safe enough having these conversations or working on any relationships, if someone doesn't care enough about you to meet you where you stand, well, then fuck them. There's a lot of people who are deliberately committed to misunderstanding you because otherwise they have to really take a good look at themselves. And that version of them is something that they're not willing to accept. Except that you were trained to see yourself as the problem in every situation and blame yourself and hold yourself accountable in a world that never seems to do the same. We need to get to a point where our personal standards for ourselves are also the standards and boundaries that we have for ourselves when engaging in the external world, either with one person or a whole group of people. Except we've been conditioned to reject boundaries. And actually, I'm not even sure most of us know what they are. 
So I'm actually going to run a little audio clip from Reverend Chris Wilson. Reverend Chris Wilson is clergy and their focus is in religious trauma. This clip will have nothing to do with religion. In other words, I would have given all y'all with religious trauma, including myself, a trigger warning. I promise it won't. That being said, if you do have religious trauma and you are looking to start healing that or addressing that or deconstructing and dismantling that, I could not recommend Reverend Chris Wilson more as a resource for you. And just to quickly clarify how they're not part of the problem, Reverend Wilson is a queer, neurodiverse parent of neurodiverse children and an activist for those communities. I've learned more about my personal neurodivergence and about my own sexuality from their content, and so I'm, I'm a huge fan. They'll be on the podcast very soon. But before we move forward on boundaries, here's a clip from the Reverend explaining exactly what those are because a lot of people, including myself, have it wrong. All right, to you, Rev. Let's talk about the difference between boundaries and rules. Boundaries are things you set for yourself, saying, if this situation happens, I am uncomfortable and therefore I will take X, Y, and Z action. There's something you set for yourself. But if you set a boundary that restricts the autonomy of another person, that's not a boundary, that's a rule. If you create rules for other people, they have to agree to those rules without being coerced to do so or forced to do so. If they agree to the rule, then it's a rule you've established consensually together and you can hold people to that. Those things can be renegotiated in any relationship. But what I typically see happen is people who don't know the difference between a boundary and a rule try to enforce their boundaries by creating rules for other people. And when the other person exerts any kind of autonomy to choose for themselves, the person here goes, oh my God, you victimized me. You you violated my boundaries. And very often this comes in a very toxic kind of group dynamic where the people are like, you can't talk about this uncomfortable topic about me being oppressive because that's violating my boundaries. I'm uncomfortable, so you're violating my boundaries now. And they don't want to be held accountable. So anything that brings up their accountability now is a boundary violation. So you become somehow the oppressor by calling them to account for their own bad behavior. And this is something I've seen over and over and over again in toxic relationships in the kink community and in the polyamory community. Now, this happens in, in the straight community as well, but I'm not in those communities, so I don't care about them. The baseline is that this happens very often because people are weaponizing the positive things that we can talk about in psychology, the way we can have healthy relationships. They take those terms, weaponize them, and flip them on their heads in a way that allows them to continue to justify their bullshit. So were they what you thought or in listening to that, did you perhaps like myself realize that you were convoluting boundaries and rules with or without getting express consent? Because I think something that's incredibly important as we move forward is that we both establish and hold firmer protective boundaries around ourselves. And as we establish consensual rules in our community for how we interact with each other, well, I just think this is all incredibly important, which leads me to my next therapeutic insight. As I've said a million times, what our community has in common with each other and collectively, of course, is our shared trauma, which is peer-on-peer -peer attack therapy. Unfortunately, this means that insofar as we are not healed, we can deny, deflect, and project that trauma reenactment on others within our community or the entire community itself. Attack therapy, aka tough love, originally tender loving care, uh, the game, encounter groups, all that jazz, were created by narcissists. And side note, I don't have a psychology degree. I am in no position to diagnose anyone. It's a mistake I've made in the past and been called on and I try to do better. And so I'm not attempting to diagnose anyone with NPD here. But I think we can all agree that Chucky e. Diedrich and a lot of these guys that designed and utilized these techniques, especially on children, were doing so from a extreme power imbalance, from a coercive level where they absolutely do not care about the safety or stability of this person. This is purely to bend you to their will. 
And so it stands that oftentimes I recognize this behavior because I understand DARVO. So DARVO is a relatively new acronym coined by Jennifer Fried. I probably mispronounced that, but it's not Fried. I think it's Fried. And she founded a nonprofit, which is called Institutional Courage. And this is why this is so relevant to us. Their mission is to help survivors hold institutions accountable for the systemic harm and trauma that they cause. These are specifically often institutions that are geared towards helping or healing and do the opposite. And if they're doing the opposite of their mission model systemically and chronically, one can assume that that's really not their intention at all. So DARVO is how the victim narcissist, not my terminology, responds to a question or a criticism. DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, Offender. So if you make the mistake of questioning, correcting, critiquing, or criticizing something one of these victim narcissists has said or done, DARVO will be their typical response. So they're going to deny it, say that they didn't do that or that wasn't their attention. They're going to attack you sometimes with the typical ways of suggesting that you're crazy or you are exaggerating or you always do this. And then they're going to lay the framework that your criticism or your question or your critique was at its very root an attack on them. You may be saying, hey, can't this be more accessible or more inclusive? But they're just going to say, look, there they go, gatekeeping, trying to destroy everything that they're not in control of. These people are trauma-informed to the extent that they're able to use these trauma-informed techniques and tactics against other people. I know that we've been conditioned to avoid conflict through, through chronic conflict, but I found a few things that don't necessarily... <laughs> work for me, but don't exactly escalate things as much as I tend to do. Because in the past, I would just completely flail around and be like, everybody sees this, right? This is absolutely not acceptable. And I'm still going to continue to go with asking if the behavior is what I think it is. As an example, in a couple group things where someone suggested that this podcast was a danger to the survivor movement and, you, you know, yada, yada. My response to that whole like group barrage of many, many texts was to simply ask, are you attempting to gaslight me? Everyone's always going to deny this, but especially if you're in a collective environment, other people will see that behavior and they will understand what's happening. Unfortunately, people are cowards, other people and myself. For the other people end, in a lot of these group chats, which don't exist anymore because the advocates that controlled them all shut them down after they like escalated far too far, but often everyone that I would consider an ally within those group chats would remain silent while these situations were escalating and ongoing in the group chat itself, but then they would text and call us outside of that environment be like I can't believe that they're treating you this way this is horrible which for the record wasn't helpful and all of those people have proven themselves to be exactly that type of person at this point but that tends to be what happens it's cool nobody listening to this is expecting or used to anyone coming to their rescue so again I'm not a professional and I actually do not have an effective tool to completely de-escalate a situation with someone who is committed to having a confrontation but there are two additional things I use a lot. Again, they don't work, but um, they, I don't know, I like them. Number one, I ask questions. I was recently pulled into a situation with a friend of mine that's been trying to return and adopt a dog to a rescue for quite literally nine months. And it had turned into this like horrifically hostile situation. And like there's this group text and every interaction is like three pages of a tirade. She would ask a question or for a clarification on direction, and then she'd get like 300 words from this person with all of these accusations and all of these details about how everything is her fault. And her response was unfortunately always the same because she, like me, is used to narcissists, but not an expert in avoiding or ending those interactions. And I wonder if any of you do this too, because I definitely do. Remember, she's just asking a question like, what time do I meet so-and-so here? And now getting like this ridiculous full history of jazz. And then she would respond to that with all of the examples of what happened in those scenarios. So 
yeah, you said I did this, but this is what happened here. And so it was really just this whole exercise of her continuously defending herself and not moving forward. And I think that we've been conditioned that way. I can always hold myself accountable. I'm always doing that, right? Like everything, and we're talking macro, micro in the whole universe is my fucking fault. Did I ask for this or this or this? Yes, of course I asked for that. Did I manifest this in my reality? Absolutely. Yes, it is this fucker's fault right here. Yeah, she punched me, but I told her to go fuck herself. And so, yeah, I got punched. That's my fault. But not everything is your fault and you are only responsible for you in every situation. And so if I feel like I'm in some sort of like cycle that I can't escape conversationally with some sort of narcissistic trait exhibitor, I stick to questions and I stick to quoting them and questioning those quotations. AKA, you said this. Is that what you meant? Often they make up completely untrue things or call you a liar. I don't send them a book about how that's not exactly what happened anymore. I send them a literal screenshot of the truth. Using my friend's dog rescue debacle example again, she was like, I've been asking for your help rehoming this animal since July. The rescue said, no, you have not. You are a liar. I told her to send the screenshot of her original text messages in July. The reason I say that these aren't successful in de-escalating or escaping one of these Darvo-esque situations is because when you do ask a question or you do give proof back to this person who's attempting to gaslight and distort your reality, especially if they're trying to do that in front of another person, an audience, if you will, someone that would then have evidence of this, their response isn't de-escalation when you prove them wrong. I mean, think about it from their perspective. They're taking that as an attack on their reality. Just like they're deliberately attempting to distort and morph your sense of reality and force you by any means necessary to validate their distortion, you clarifying and confirming that that reality isn't real is obviously a fundamental issue for them. This is cognitive dissonance. If you're innocent, in this case, you're just blowing the rap off their bullshit. If anybody has a way to effectively escape or resolve these situations, Again, my email is Miranda at talktravel.org. But that's just kind of what I stick to because we're in the era of the screenshot wall of hate land where people are like, look at everything that these people said or did to me out of context. So I think it's better off that it's just screenshots of them arguing with themselves. Something that I do find to be helpful in communicating with people who don't really want to communicate with you, though, is the dear man technique. Again, this is another DBT technique, so if we're not into DBT, just totally skip ahead. Because reminder, I wound up using at least a year of therapy focused on how I could navigate the survivor community and dealing with all of these experiences of feeling attacked and excluded from that community. And at this point, my therapist and I had gone through like all of these chat logs with these specific individuals or in the group chats to kind of get a realistic understanding of of what was actually going on here. And turns out per usual that I was minimizing the experience and gaslighting myself because I just didn't know how to deal with the fact that this was a toxic experience. And one of the worst parts of this experience was that these individuals who, for the record, didn't know me, we'd never really interacted with each other individually, and we certainly didn't go to the program together, they were convincing people that I did know in real life, that I did go to the program with, and that I was working with, that I was who they said I was. So my therapy homework one week was to compose a dear man letter to one of these survivors that I felt a kinship with and wanted to be able to, you know, resolve our relationship and move forward. It turned out to be a dear man letter to the entire survivor community where I set personal boundaries because I really felt like I was becoming like a self-sacrificial lamb to feed into some sort of weird victim mentality that I wanted to have. And since I don't want to be a victim, I can't continue to put myself into experiences where people are deliberately trying to villainize me, thus victimizing me. And you can use the dear man technique from everything like, hey, babe, wash the dishes to like, hey, babe, if you cheat on me again, we're done. 
So definitely go check out some of the worksheets and some of the cute videos online. I was going to pull an audio clip, but all of them would include some program lingo that I wasn't totally comfortable with, so I didn't. But the D is for describe. So you describe the situation as concisely and objectively as possible. Your goal here is to specifically clarify the situation and your ask, but without causing the other person to become defensive. Now, their reaction and response to you is not your responsibility, but that's why you're supposed to be mindful because if you're deliberately just picking fights with people, then you're not serious. The E is for express. This is the I statement. This is how you feel about it. Like, I'm setting a boundary. I need you to take out the trash Tuesday night is your D. Your express is like when I wake up Wednesday morning and the trash didn't get taken away, I get stressed out. I'm stressed out by having nowhere to put our trash all week. When you go out and fuck the stripper, like, I get jealous. I don't think you're supposed to use dear man in, like, expressly toxic situations. Then the A is for assert. I often see people suggesting this should actually be formed in a question. I think in general when you're dealing with people, questions is best. Getting people to like clarify like what they're actually talking about or where they actually stand on something is so important. Not just because I fill in so much of my own assumptions, but you know, yeah, maybe that's it. So like, will you take the trash out now? Like, dead ass, that could be your A for assert. Like, will you do it now? And then if the person isn't immediately like, totally, I'll go take out the trash, then we're at the R in dear, which is just reinforce. You're just going to reinforce and reassert and go through those steps. And you're going to do this utilizing the MAN acronym, M, mindfulness, as we said. Your goal here is communication. Your goal is to effectively resolve whatever this is. So again, obviously, this is not for communications where we are committed to misunderstanding each other and to having further conflict. And if you care about someone, it's not about them admitting that they're wrong or feeling bad about it. It's just about, like, communicating. This is win-win, baby. These are relationships, I'm told. The A in the man part of the acronym is for appear confident. They're not suggesting you actually should be confident. They're suggesting you need to appear confident. So we're maintaining eye contact, not ABA style, just genuine eye contact. We're not slunching. We're not mumbling. We're just appearing confident. Nothing you're saying is mean or wrong here. We're just communicating. And the last letter when we're reinforcing is to negotiate. If we need to negotiate something here, this is where we're going to do it. The goals with negotiation is you need to know your limits for what you're willing to compromise, but to the extent of those limits... If you care about this relationship, I mean, compromise away. I find when I'm making a bunch of lists for my dear man letters that I can really deconstruct what's important to me and what's a priority here and then where I'm having an unrealistic expectation or like with the M for mindfulness, sometimes I notice that I don't actually want to resolve this. I just want them to admit that they're wrong and they fucked up. And honestly, at that point, we come back to the boundaries and rules. You know, if this relationship is unhealthy in this way, then I might not need to be in this relationship. And that's not personal. Your boundaries for yourself, it's personal to you and it's not about everybody around you. If you choose that you don't want to engage directly with other survivors at all because of the shared trauma, because it's unsafe for you, because it's triggering for you, by all means, just don't. There's a lot of people that don't engage with survivors from their own program. I know that that is the most triggering for me personally. So if that's uncomfortable for you, just don't put yourself through anything you're not comfortable with. Which brings us to our last point, which (laughs) y'all know me, it could be another hour. Set those egg timers, y'all. Let's do this. It is so important for us to recognize the difference between what we want out of life in ourselves or in a relationship versus our trauma. Since quarantine, isolation has become an experience that's more relatable to the masses. But a ton of trauma survivors, especially like ourselves, tend to isolate for different reasons. We have receipts a mile long on why the outside world and everyone in it is incredibly dangerous. 
And you're not wrong. That's totally true. Hop on Twitter. Look at the world. It is a fucking dumpster fire out there. But since this is a one-way conversation, (laughs) joke's on you, uh, let's take a non-consensual rom-com ride for a second. Let's look at love, shall we? Successful marriages or long-term companionship in our community is an exception, not the rule. Now, if you've heard Wes Good's episode on the podcast, Wes Good, uh, the singer for Dead Wolf, he was from the family school. He was in Family 3, but after I was there. So if you heard that one, you know that I'm a huge dweeb for the love stories that lasted through and after the program. And then another Family 3 survivor who was on the podcast, Laura, came back with her wife to have an episode that was really focused on how the program affects their relationship and how they communicate around it. Because I mean this, and not just because the science shows it with the aces or yada, yada, yada. I believe the most important thing you can do for you is to build one safe relationship. Based on the science behind the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, if you're unfamiliar, we have a 10-minute table topic breaking it down, so go check that out. But based on all that science that we've been gathering since the 90s, we know that there are two relationships with children that can directly combat the potential trauma of multiple ACEs. One of those, of course, being a safe relationship with an adult. This is an adult that validates them, finds worth in them, and shows them that self-worth. This relationship to some extent needs to be unconditional. Again, we never mean enably. We mean that love has no conditions. It's okay. You fucked up. We'll work through it. Like people make mistakes, dig it. But I don't love you because you're perfect. The other relationship that can do this for a child that's combating childhood trauma is a romantic relationship. So even if you grew up in a home that checked off way too many of the ACE factors, If your first romantic relationship was one that was genuine, like this person, you guys genuinely cared about each other, that has all the difference. And so we're going to make this all about me. Firstly, the only reason I got to the family school was because I had a fight with my high school boyfriend and thought I'd fucking show him and got in the car with my parents in the middle of the night for this alleged one month long, you know, evaluation period that, (laughs) jokes on me, wasn't a month. These kinds of manipulative tactics were things I'd learned from my parents' relationship. Picking fights with my boyfriend in high school was again a reenactment of my parents' relationship because I believed that what love was was being willing to stay even after you had a huge fight. And so I was constantly putting people in my life in a position to leave me. I expected them to leave me. I expected them to reject me. And I wanted to give them every opportunity to do so. Anyways, after this month-long review, they decide that I'm doing so well in this residential temporary facility that I would thrive under long-term residential support. This is, of course, based on the comparison that I was a walking, talking dumpster fire prior to being dropped off here. At this original facility, I did have access to a phone. And so in my conversations with people in my support system, one of my main concerns was my boyfriend. I was a 17-year-old girl, and he was my first love and one of the first safe relationships that I had ever had. And so, yeah, that was really all that mattered to me. He wrote me a letter that I was not allowed to read. Girl, I didn't think that was going to choke me up. I remember getting that letter after I got out of the school. I have I never read it. But on the outside of the envelope, he promised to wait for me. And obviously, (laughs) we were teenagers, so I forgive him. And while I was at the program, this was something that was regularly used on me, especially when they were slut shaming me, right? Because in the tough love program, even if you're a virgin, you're a slut. And I definitely wasn't a virgin. In fact, the pedophiles at my program made me write a concise list that they reviewed and had me redraft over and over again of all the sexual acts I had performed on my boyfriend and like a time log. How many times did I give him head in his car? Was it in the winter? This And describe these situations. Like literally as a writer, they were asking me to write child porn for them. 
which would have been one thing, but then for them to use those descriptions against me in my table topics to then assert that, you know, he didn't really love me. He was just using me for sex. He was probably fucking someone else right now, yada, yada, which, of course, I did not believe, even though it turned out to be true. And here's where it gets fucked up. So reminder, I am raised in Catholic purist monogamy land. Like I was forced to tell priests when I humped a pillow when I was like nine, 10, you know, I had to every week let him know how many times I humped a pillow, what I was thinking about when I did it, which finally ready to embrace the fact that it was all four Ninja Turtles at the exact same time. Or Michael the Archangel, because that is absolutely what happens when you raise your children in Catholicism. But what's really important to remember about purity culture, especially in Christianity, which the family school was absolutely a Christian program. We had to go to chapel twice a day. Our dean of students was a gay priest, you know, like super Christian. But it also had all the jazz for the Jewish students, too, which is because they wanted the Jewish money from New York. And I'm someone who works on a lot of religious program activism, especially with the IFB survivors. But oddly enough, I never recognize the family school as a religious program. And purity culture is like ironic, which I guess is the right use of the word, but just doesn't have the punch. So someone tell me what the right word we should use is. Because purity culture is always, in my experience, run by pedophiles. It's conditioning and grooming children to expect a level of normalcy when having completely sexually inappropriate conversations and experiences with an adult. And I'm not being a Sith here. I'm not dealing in absolutes. I'm not telling you guys that every single church in America or the world has some pedos running purity culture there. I'm just saying wherever you see purity culture, a pedo's not far behind. My program, like a lot of other people's programs, was incredibly heavy on purity culture, and this is a perfect example. There were purity promises that the boys had to do in the bunks to promise not to touch each other at night. If those boys then suspected anyone of breaking the purity promise or they just had it out for somebody, then I could bet as a girl that my next breakfast with the boys, with the staff, everybody after chapel would include some of these teenage boys getting called up at the table during breakfast to get berated as perverts for touching themselves in the middle of the night, which again was not always or even usually true. In my limited experience, the accusations of girls touching themselves in our trailer were not true. I know they were not true because we all lived in a double wide trailer together and they were not touching themselves. Oh, but Miranda, how do you know? Because I know fucking everything, you guys. No, seriously, this is the Catskill Mountains in a trailer with like 18 girls in it. You can hear bed covers moving. And that's what this would be. Somebody would hear somebody's covers moving or hearing them turning around in their bunk. And then they would yell their name and tell them to stop touching themselves. And then everybody would start doing it. It would become this whole chant thing. And then the next morning, we would decide whether or not we believed them. Which usually in these programs, they're going to believe the accusations made against another child unless the child making those accusations is kind of up for readjustment. They're conditioning you to call each other out and especially to make up or to escalate allegations against each other. But then also it's a trap. This is why when kids reach like the highest level of the hierarchy, the upper shirts, the anchors or whatever, that most of them are also going to get knocked all the way back to the bottom at some point in that process. This program does not work unless you are expecting the bottom to drop out from underneath you at any time, especially when things are going good. I think in the It's Okay to Not Be Okay and Love Yourself Anyway episode with Laura, she does a really great job from a queer perspective of talking about the vicarious trauma of experiencing this kind of verbal sexual abuse during meals all the time, whether it was directed at heterosexual kids or not. Because there's also like the whole sexual abuse reenactments, talking about how you used to rape your sister, all that stuff while everybody is being forced to eat. Which is the conditioning in and of itself, right? To get people to move forward with eating meals and a sense of normalcy and false comfort during literal psychological torture. 
because if you remember in the program when people first get there, there's a lot of refusing to eat their food, refusing to finish their food. I think it's the first few days at the family school you weren't required to eat everything on your plate or maybe it was the first 24 hours, who knows. But then after that, everything that you've left, whether it's your full meal or a bite, is saved for you until the next meal in saran wrap. And that can go on for weeks. This conditioning is how you see the video at Lakeside where Cornelius is restrained to death in front of his peers while they continue to eat their lunch. I have a sneaky suspicion that a lot of the most horrific jazz goes down during meal times. I think there's like this really weird aspect of forcing the body to continue this digestive process while you're psychologically digesting this kind of a trauma. So there's the purity promises and the public call outs and the sexual assault reenactments and then the blaming you for being sexually assaulted. My fourth step had to include all of my sexual experiences, but not just the one with my boyfriend at home. So it included, you know, being sexually assaulted as a child. In fact, this was the first time in my life that I'd ever talked to anyone about both of those experiences. So to have both of those experiences blamed on me was, I, I still don't understand how that's affected me. What I did learn within the last couple years of therapy is that I did not consider myself a sexual assault survivor in any way, but according to my therapist, I guess I was molested. And it's a huge bummer that the first dude who ever touched my tits was my uncle. It's a bigger bummer that the first time I told anybody it was used to paint me as a perverse, manipulative Jezebel, and I went through the incredible anxiety of having to rewrite that experience detail for detail over and over again, read it in front of my peers and in front of these pedophiles, and then present it to my parents, which I guess is why I was 35 the first time I could hear someone when they told me that that was sexual assault. Like I was supporting the Me Too movement and did not relate to it personally, which is also why when these situations would happen in my life again later, like one of the guys from IT department consistently calling me and jerking off on the phone, you know, or temp jobs where they made me wear skirts and stand on tables and dust things while they looked up my skirt and things like that. Why I never sued anybody or I never stood my ground. I just like ran away as quickly as possible. Because that was my fault. I asked for that, right? It's my responsibility that they fell for my Jezebel manipulation. So March 2003 comes around. My birthday is at the end of April, and I know I can finally legally walk then, but there are genuinely days where I consider if I'm going to stay. I mean, all of my friends and my boyfriend and everybody have moved on and forgotten about me, right? And if I walk, I'll be homeless. I'll have nowhere to go. I'll be stuck in Hancock, New York. I'll probably get trafficked like my friends did when they left. And I saw what happened to them when they came back. And once you're out of the crucible portion of the program, you know, the consistent work labor and heavy, heavy sanctions and all of that jazz, it's, it's a total fucking trip. Because when they were leaving me alone... I was in the Catskill Mountains, and it was beautiful. I saw the aurora borealis, you guys. And that moment is perfectly the dichotomy. You know, they didn't want to let us go outside to see it. And one of the staffers argued that it would be this great newsletter moment for the parents. And so for that reason, they let us. And so there we were, 300 kids in the Catskill Mountains, freezing and silent, not allowed to speak, not allowed to make eye contact. It was still, it still is one of the most beautiful memories of my life. And I can still get inside it, you know, inside that moment in time that's running parallel to the linear experience we have now. And that moment is why I have a ton of sympathy for wilderness therapy survivors. And I'm so grateful that's not what happened to me. Because I step into that moment a few times a week and I can confidently tell you that it was nothing like it was painted in that newsletter. Whatever peace I found in whatever moments of disassociation in those mountains is not reflective of the serenity at a therapeutic boarding school. 
Just like the mountains and the lakes and the golden retriever didn't make it a beautiful, happy place, neither did this moment. And I can see it in that memory that keeps repeating. I felt then, and I still do feel now, that that sky was an act of mutual defiance. The universe recognizing and reaching out to those kids in that moment so that we could hold it with us for the rest of our lives. Or I'm just super dramatic. But either way, it's these little things that helped us survive in that experience. And one of the main things that helped me was harboring my boyfriend's t-shirt. I had somehow managed to sleep with it every night without people realizing that it belonged to my boyfriend. And if you think I'm weird, you can suck it. My kid is literally having her long distance boyfriend mail her a sweatshirt as we speak. So like this is a thing. This is this. It is known. And then walks in Tom Malkowski, except I didn't know his name then. Because when you come into the family school, you're on a six month blackout and a family only blackout and all that jazz. We never broke blackout. I never attempted to speak to him and he never made eye contact with me. And maybe the only reason that I noticed him was because he was taller than everyone else. And so even in roundup with the whole school, I could see him from across the hall. Or maybe it was the jacket he had, which was the ski jacket I always wanted. But you guys remember what it was like to look at somebody and get an endorphin rush, right? And that's what Tom Malkowski was for me. If this had been anywhere else, I would have just been another teenage girl excited to get up and go to school to see a boy in the hallways. I have ADHD, so I'm dopamine deficient in the first place. And then being in this experience where my stress hormones were hyperactive and chronic, I was genuinely just looking for an endorphin push. And so I was very much using him. I wasn't having lustful thoughts about him. It was totally innocent. I had a crush on the boy, but I wasn't allowed to have a crush on a boy where I was. In fact, there was a name for it, and it was called a negative contract. I wasn't really getting with the program, so this negative contract was not something I intended to bring up about myself. But over the next couple weeks, it really started to fuck with me because I was being programmed and I was being brainwashed. Number one, based on Catholic monogamy culture, I was coveting someone with my mind. And I was also in a relationship, so this was adulterous. And I've blocked a lot of this, and I'm not ready to work on a lot of it. But I think that the deal breaker for me was that near the end of this experience, I was catching myself proactively attempting to get his attention. And I'm a teenage girl, so whether I was humiliated by, like, that desperate behavior... Or whether it was more the guilt of feeling like I was cheating on my boyfriend. I'm really not sure what the determining factor was there, but I, it just it got to be too much. This was the first time I was trying on that Jezebel costume they were trying to put on me. So I both saw myself as a cheater and harming my boyfriend, as well as attempting to distract this young man from getting the therapy he needed and to lure him into a negative contract. And so I did what every good cult kid does, and I went to my sponsor, and I ratted myself out. And this is what I still do to myself now. I still blame myself for everything, even if it's not really happening. For the record, Tom didn't know I fucking existed. And my boyfriend didn't know what the fuck was going on, and he'd already moved on. But I'm here gagging on my own tears because I am a fucking Eve in the Garden of Lilith. And of course, if you guessed that the program staff took this as a huge win in Miranda progress, ding, 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 yeah, they did. And so I called myself up, I admitted everything, I gave them my boyfriend's t-shirt, I tried to put myself on blackout with boys temporarily again. Because remember, I'm an evil whore temptress. Side note, my mother named me after the Tempest, so yes, everything is still my mother's fault. And for the record, this is the only time I currently remember getting with the program, if you will. As this was playing out, I genuinely believed what I was doing was the right thing. And I had made it incredibly clear to my sponsor and my family leaders that no, he had not participated in this negative contract. He'd never made eye contact with me. The guy did not know I existed. And when I started at FFS, Cindy Argyros was my sponsor. She's the wife of the owner, and she's a complete fucking psychotic cunt who made me eat my vomit. 
But at this point, I officially had a different sponsor and I genuinely trusted and thought this person cared about me. And she promised me that this would not get misconstrued and brought up in Tom's family or put on him. And honestly, I still believe she believed that. And to be clear, I don't know that it was. What I know is that the next time that I saw Tom, he was lying on the ground in front of family three, choking on his own blood to death. He wanted to escape the abuse so bad that he took a one-story dive headfirst off a balcony. And I am constantly conflicted between using my voice and my platform to speak and scream out about Tom Malkowski in an effort to try to hold his abusers accountable for his death and blaming myself and making things all about me. I've spoken to Tom's junior sponsor, who is the one who watched him dive off that balcony, and he doesn't know what staff was speaking with Tom about right before he died. If I knew for sure that it was the bullshit that I started and that I caused, it would be a lot easier for me to champion this cause. But just like every other funeral I've ever been to in life, I feel like I'm an imposter. And I might not know if it's really my fault that he's dead, but I'm still going to blame myself. But you know who's really to blame? It's the family school. They deliberately misrepresented and mismarketed themselves to children who had depressive issues, suicidality, and other mental health issues when they had no credentials, no training, and no therapies. What they did have was rampant abuse. And just like every other kid who quote-unquote commits suicide in a program, Tom Malkowski's death was blamed on him. It's why I'd really like if we'd stop calling these things suicide. The term is quite literally a crime, and so therefore it makes the victim of the suicide the one responsible for the crime. I don't think that's fair in this situation at all. Not only were they lacking in adequate supervision or support for people who were dealing with serious mental health issues, but their quote-unquote treatment was literally child abuse and in every way pushed children towards suicide. If the only power that you have is to opt out, I mean, you're going to consider using it. As someone who lives with suicidality, knowing that I do have the choice to bow out whenever I'm ready is empowering for me. It's why myself and a lot of other people use fantasies of suicide to keep ourselves alive. What I witnessed with that boy dying in front of me was not a suicide. It was an escape. I simultaneously hold myself responsible for him being in that situation and also hold it against myself for not doing anything about it when it was happening. Every single day for the last 18 years, Tom Malkowski has been perpetually dying in my peripheral vision. In the moment as it was happening, I knew exactly what was being asked of me. Whether or not this was my fault or whether or not I liked the kid was irrelevant. He was in abject terror. And pain. If you're a vegan or you've ever watched movies about slaughterhouses, you can imagine the kind of terror I'm talking about. Except this wasn't food. This was a child. And this child didn't do what she needed to do in that moment. It replays over and over, asking me to make another choice, but I can't. Which is why when we see things like the Justice for Cornelius situation, it's like, Oh God, it's happening all over again, and there's no justice there either. And so the last boy that I ever had a crush on died in front of me when I was 17 years old. And a month later, I turned 18, and I was able to leave. But I didn't get justice for him, or myself. And then I went back to my high school and had to sit through classes with my ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend and prom, and that was fucking fun. But I didn't make a scene because I'd been very well trained at this point. And the next time I tried to have a relationship, which was the last time I tried to have an actual relationship, I was in my early 20s and I was trying to blend in with an NPC, if you will. I picked somebody who was safe and stable and simple and had a good connection with their family and their community because I was a young single mom and I figured this was the safest way to stay out of the radar. I was trying to assimilate quietly into society. But a few years in, by the time that relationship got kind of serious, I didn't even recognize myself. 
I was so focused on trying to prove that I was lovable and that I could assimilate as a constructive member of society that I'd never really asked myself what I wanted. And I hadn't really considered whether or not it mattered to me who loved me or what part of society I was able to be accepted into. I definitely cared about this guy and I loved his mom and his sister, but it really didn't feel fair. I felt like I was using him. I remember getting super high and looking into the future and being like, what happens in 15 years if I meet my actual soulmate? Am I going to like leave this guy and our family? And if I don't, is it really fair to my actual soulmate if I went and married this guy and had a family with him and now I'm no longer available? And what if I don't have a soulmate because he died at the fucking family school? What about this guy's soulmate? Like, maybe she's a really nice girl. Obviously, the soulmate construct was some sort of propaganda that got through to me at the time, too, right? And I shit you not. Like, I I haven't shit enough today of IBS and, like, we're not even at a halfway mark, maybe because we've been standing here chain smoking, talking to a fucking computer all day. But I didn't even understand what had happened in this situation until, like, two weeks ago, chain smoking, spinning circles in this here garage. This deadass happened, like, over a decade ago, and I didn't even understand until two weeks ago. So it's Valentine's Day or our anniversary or both. Who gives a fuck? We go see a movie together and we bring his sister with us because she's awesome and I loved her. And this movie is, drum roll please, Sucker Punch. So if you haven't seen Sucker Punch, it's a movie that gets pretty bad fucking reviews. And I just think it's because they haven't been through the troubled teen industry. And I could have a whole additional episode on how I feel about depictions of institutional child abuse and how important it is that they have some level of efficacy, both if it's a documentary project in protecting trauma survivors instead of exploiting them, and then also in narrative that it doesn't, you know, it's not victim blaming or apologistic. I personally got into documentary filmmaking so that I could tell this story. And so, like, I obviously have a bias. And maybe I'm a little extremist with my standards, but two survivors OD'd during the filming of The Last Stop. So being trauma-informed and having support services available is absolutely a life or death imperative. But back to Miranda's absolute favorite movie, Sucker Punch, which is not my absolute favorite movie, but it did completely fundamentally change my life and I'm forever grateful. Fuck, I've recorded this clip so many times I'm trying to say this without spoiler alerting. Fuck. So the reason Sucker Punch is relevant to us is it's the story of a teenage girl who gets institutionalized against her will because she reports an abuser. The story then follows her and a group of other teenage girls who are being institutionally abused alongside her. And when I say that this is the most accurate fucking depiction ever, I am hoping you will argue with me. But like you lose (laughs) because this is a one way recording motherfucker what? Not only does Sucker Punch pretty much cover the majority of the spectrums of the kinds of abuses that happen in these places, but it's also the only time I've really seen film accurately portray the disassociation process for preservation and survival. Therein, why most people do not like or understand this movie. Because if you're not a survivor of institutional child abuse and you saw the trailer for this movie, you think you're signing up for this really fun CGI action flick, which it is. It is excellent. The action is so good. The eye candy. But if that's all you thought you were signing up for, then you might feel tricked into all of the child trafficking, institutional abuse, sexual assault and mental health shit. Also, if you are not neurodivergent, don't have mental health issues, and have never been through anything like this, I think it is possible that you might have issues following the plot. I deadass see bitches on Reddit being like, this was the worst movie ever, what the fuck was even happening? Whereas if you do have experience, or you didn't see the trailer, or you signed up for what it actually was, then the shifting between disassociative survival tactics and those realities not only makes a lot of sense, but it gives an emotional journey and it's cathartic. And yeah, it's depressing as fuck, but it wasn't it? And again, if you're not a survivor, the end is just pure depression, whereas if you're a survivor, it's just, woof. 
So if you haven't seen Sucker Punch, it comes with an incredibly high trigger and content warning, especially for survivors, but I couldn't recommend it more. What I will not recommend it for is a film to help explain to your partners or your support system what you went through. It was, however, a litmus test for me in my relationship. Because my dumbass, when I tell you that I ugly cried through this entire movie in the theaters, I ugly cried through the entire movie. We're talking all blocks lifted. I'd been calling this a fucking boarding school. I'd gone back to the goddamn reunion. And then all of a sudden, woof, the blinders are off. I was so teleported through this process that I didn't even realize my boyfriend had slept through this goddamn movie. And you can imagine how personally triggered I was that not only did he sleep through the movie, but he thought it sucked. I understood all that. I've always understood that in the narrative of how this relationship ended. But it's the next part that I didn't comprehend. So after we get home, I am such a fucking wreck that this dude is like, toss me a pillow. I'm going to go sleep on the couch. So I am like, you can get the fuck out of my house. And I dead ass packed homie up and he was moved out by the next afternoon. We literally never had a phone call, a text message or any conversation from the moment of throw me a pillow because you're having a meltdown to today. And I get it. You guys got the chronological version. But like I had no idea that that incident had anything to do with my trauma or the program. Like, it's pretty clear to me now that I felt invalidated, unheard, and unsupported by my significant other, who I was during that very weekend considering spending the rest of my life with. And I was just like, I cannot fucking do this. I was like, you do not see me. You do not know me. You do not have my fucking back. But I didn't know that. Until two weeks ago, I didn't understand that what I experienced during this period was me feeling completely let down by my partner in life. I didn't see Sucker Punch as unblocking my trauma until two weeks ago. I didn't see Sucker Punch as related to this at all. And the next year of my life was pretty incredible. I got into roller derby to empower myself. And then I had the whole CPS bullshit called on me by my fake friends, neighbors throwing bricks through my windows, telling my other neighbors I'm fucking their husbands while they're at work. I have my daughter's biological father because of the CPS court thing, contacting him, taking me to paternity court for the first time ever. I lost my job. I had a new dog. It was a lot. But that's when I made the decision to move back to New York and pursue documentary film so I could tell this story. And there's a few reasons I dragged you through that rant. I've been celibate and single for over four years now so that I could deal with my relational traumas and be capable of being a good partner to whoever comes up in the future if they do. But I've also been doing that from a perspective where I don't think I want to be in a romantic relationship with anyone. But when I look back on the evidence through my life, I feel like I'm misinterpreting it. I see how unhappy I was trying to make romances work with the wrong people. But they weren't the right people for me, and I had a lot of trauma I hadn't dealt with. If I want to spend my life alone having my romantic attachment be with some multidimensional energy that I've been having a relationship with since childhood, <laughs> real thing, not a joke, then good for me. I told you I wanted all of the Ninja Turtles, all of them. They are mine. I am the fall in love with the alien or the selkie or the archangel kind of a girl. Humans, who needs them? And during my whole spiritual healing stuff, it's like, oh, well, if we're all part of the one collective consciousness, what's the point in me choosing one over another? Am I not better off focusing my energies on the collective masculine energy? And I'm not knocking that. I functioned from that space exclusively for years, still vibing it. In fact, three years ago today, I was at the Bieltana Festival on the sacred hill of Ishna and met my perfect manifestation of man. He had just chopped off his beard and thrown it into the fire and broken his staff and thrown it into the fire after months of walking to raise money for the homeless. And he spoke Irish. And sounds like Thor because apparently the Norse gods come from Wicklow, uh, which makes sense. And I remember looking into that sacred fire and I was like, 
what is it supposed to mean? I mean, like I always believed if I was ever going to be with a human, I'd meet them here at the Beltane fires on the sacred hill of Ishna. Is this that? And the sacred fire said, "Mm -hmm, silly child. What this is, is showing you that you can have anything you want. If a big ginger bearded Wicklow man that walks for months for the homeless is what you're looking for, well, there he is. And if you don't want this one, that's fine. There'll be another fire. There'll be another Wicklow man. And so when that perfect, beautiful man went down to the catstone and told me he'd be back in 20 minutes, what did I do? Oh, you know I Irish goodbye his ass and whisked myself out of there as quickly as possible to remain a mystery. And as soon as I got back to America, I stalked him out on social media and saved a couple videos of his homeless hiking. Or hiking for the homeless. And if you think that I'm an idiot and missed out on my one opportunity to be reunited with my soulmate in this dimension, (laughs) joke's on you, I am everyone. However, and also when I did that whole Irish goodbye move, I 100% expected to be able to come back to the next year's festival, which all these people always go to, um, except COVID happened. (laughs) So that didn't happen. And that might be the worst ending to a rom-com ever. My point is, I love being a feral, self-isolating bog bitch. I value those skellig women who lived alone on the islands and worked their magic and reared heroes. That's definitely somebody that I want to be. But I'm not a crone yet, and I'm not sure what I want before then. And whether it's friendships or romantic relationships, if we're going to have relationships with the world and relationships with ourselves, we really are going to have to get to the work of looking at our trauma and healing it. And as much as I do honor and value the sacred hermit, I also really value informed consent and sovereignty. And it's okay if I choose to spend the rest of my life alone on my own little island so that I can stay safe and feel valued and welcome, but I don't want to make that choice or any others solely from a foundation of fear. And so for those of you who don't feel like you have actual friends or you haven't been in a romantic relationship in a really long time, I hope you'll join me in figuring out whether or not that's our preference or our trauma. I don't want my trauma to control me anymore. And I don't want to wake up as an actual crone alone on an island and discover that as great as some of these moments may have been, the only reason I kept hidden and alone was because I was afraid. I don't want my fear of being rejected to keep me from being accepted ever in any meaningful relationship. And it's not just romance, it's friends too. I don't have friends. I have mutual mission makers. I have no idea what it's like to have fun anymore. I don't do anything for fun. I don't have hobbies. I don't have fucking endorphins. I'm really good at living the mission. That's who I am and that's who I always have been. But we always have to ask ourselves, is that you or is that the trauma? For years, I thought I focused so much of my life on service because I was trying to prove to myself, to the world, to the Godhead that I was a good person. But per our whole previous conversation about tracking thoughts and feelings back to their earliest origination, if I'm honest with myself, I didn't choose service. I was conditioned into it. And I want to help people and I want to serve my community and I want to save all the animals. That's all true. But I was conditioned into being a sacrificial lamb so that I could participate in some sort of self-martyrdom and then a constantly oscillating cycle of victimhood to vilification. And I'm not down with victimizing or vilifying myself anymore. I think we all need to figure out what our favorite things about ourselves are. And if I want it to be honesty and integrity and courage then I can no longer be tolerating choices based on fear. And if I'm honest with myself and I recognize that the last boy that I was in love with was taken away from me when I was thrown into an abusive pedophile run behavior modification cult in a really traumatic way that as as much as everybody wants to make fun of these teenage love stories, they can cause trauma when situations like this happen. And it absolutely did for me. So if I can recognize that, 
as well as that the last boy I had a crush on died in front of me, I guess at some point I have to stop pretending like those situations that happened to this teenager aren't a big deal and stop continuing to minimize the impact that they've had on me because they absolutely have had significant impact. I absolutely honor and value sacred spinsterhood. It's what my family was built on. But if I'm choosing to be alone because of trauma, then that's not a good reason. And I deserve better. I can't continue to allow the fear of losing something that I don't have keeping me from ever experiencing it in the first place. It still might be true that no one's ever loved me. But I'm going to work my ass off to learn to love myself. And, you know, if somebody wants to match my energies, I should probably be open to that. Oh, I forgot I'm also talking to other people. Eh, eh, eh. Let me clarify, at least for now. Please do not apply unless you're a fucking alien or a sulky. Because I've got a type and it's not human. And I hope to see more safe, positive, supportive relationships in our community. Because every time I see one of y'all with your partners out there making it work, it just warms the cockles of my cold, dried heart. And you're beautiful and you deserve it. All right, babies, go watch Sucker Punch and rate and write us a review on iTunes, Spotify, and Facebook so that others will get sucked into riding the rant with us. And we do have therapists and social workers that volunteer with us, so if you did want to write in any specific relational question for them, we'll have them answer it on air. Why not? That sounds fun. Bye.